What's up to all my Dune lovers out there? My name is Ian, and today we are going to be tracking the influences of Dune back thousands of years and go on a journey through every single work that impacted Frank Herbert's writing of one of the greatest science fiction series of all time. So let us awaken the sleeper within. The sleeper has awakened! And start to understand Dune at a deeper level. Here's an ugly truth. Transparent, I see. Writers steal all of the time and once you accept that you realize writing is a skill it's something to be built it isn't this magical thing that a couple of talented people get to do and that's why a lot of people don't accept that or don't actually steal like an artist because they don't want to recognize that they don't have all the answers or to admit that their favorite author like frank herbert has been stealing ideas left and right like a thief also frank herbert is a prime example of why reading widely and deeply is so important to become a better writer and to produce legendary works. Name an author in the last 100 years that has not read deeply and created masterpieces. They all did. Why is that? That I know so many young writers and writers of all types that don't read deeply and are filling and saturating the market with a bunch of crap because they have a huge ego problem. So let's hop into the presentation. And the first person we're going to be talking about today is Carl Jung. And Carl Jung is a German psychoanalytical thinker. He studied under Freud, but then branched off into his own more esoteric wor work. He is most known for the collective unconscious and archetypes, which we are going to be talking about today, which most impact Frank, Frank Herbert. So first of all, Frank Herbert was friends with or was mentored under some Jungian, some Jungian analysts while he was in San Francisco. And that had a big impact on him, supposedly. So. Let's hear a quote from Frank Herbert on this. I often use a Jungian mandala in squaring off characters of yarn of a yarn against each other, assigning a dominant psychological role to each. So quick overview of the archetypes. Jung said that they were axiomatic forces that live within all of us, that guide us. For instance, the, trick, the trickster, the hero, the villain, the, the king, the magician. He usually has 12, but they can be expanded to an infinite degree. Things like astrology and tarot play upon the archetypes. And what Herbert means by a Jungian mandala is that Carl Jung is also into mandalas. And another work, another person that does this actually at an insane level, because he's insane, is the author David Foster Wallace. Another person who steals really well and is a prolific author as, in his own right. And they, so what he means is that a Jungian mandala looks a certain way. And what he would do is that according to the archetypes, Frank Herbert would put a character like Paul on one side and then on the other side have someone else and they would both have um, having a dominant psychological role but in opposition. And I've been trying to figure this out for a while now. For a couple months, I've been trying to figure out with some of the main characters how this is all working and assigning some of the dominant, psycho dominant psychological roles, staying within Carl Jung's idea of the archetypes, which Frank Herbert supposedly is using. And I ran into a problem, and this is really crazy, that... Paul is not the hero. And that sounds crazy, right? Paul, and I guess I should say this now. Spoiler, we are going to be talking about today all six books of Dune. If you haven't read them yet, stop being lazy and go read them. What are you still doing? It's 2022. Time to get going. But Paul is not the hero. And that seems like the, the whole narrative of Dune is kind of an anti-messianic message. But Paul seems like the hero. But when I put him into the mandala, right? When I put Paul into the mandala... He doesn't fit as the hero because the oppositions don't make sense. Where he does fit, and it started to make sense to me, I'm going to make a whole video on this, is that Paul is actually the trickster. If you look at Paul and his character and who he is, he actually has a lot more trickster qualities than he does hero qualities. And it fits a lot better into this idea of the mandala that I am creating that Frank Herbert once again supposedly used. And if you look at a lot of the different characters, they usually have these dominant archetypal roles and i'll be making another video on this soon so if you guys want to see that subscribe to the channel so now we have the man himself william shakespeare and william shakespeare is very influential on almost everyone of course in western literature but as we're as we are about to see in justine shaw's article on some of dune's inspirations it's on moongadget.com go check that out she gets you know a lot of a lot of the connections but not all she doesn't talk about carl jung for instance and we're going to read from that right now quote particularly hamlet macbeth king lear the tempest and others paul carries his father's signet ring as did hamlet paul learns the true mood of his people by walking among them in disguise like henry v herbert's mood 
Herbert's most obvious borrowing is probably the climax of Hamlet, in which the hero publicly duels with his minor adversary, who carries the poison blade, which his major, major, major adversary looks on. Hamlet's conversation with the ghost of his dead father is echoed in the conversation between Keynes and the ghost of his dead father. Paul's home, Caladan, echoes Shakespeare's character, Caliban. Shakespearean scholars have noted that Caliban is probably a stinky rich spelling of cannibal. The Caladan is based on Caliban theory is reinforced by Herbert's invention of the Caliban aliens in his subsequent novel, Whipping Stars. Shakespeare conveyed his character's thoughts by having them make aside moments where they spoke directly to the audience, openly revealing their innermost thoughts. For instance, we look at a quote. Here's one that I like to use. The truth could be worse than he imagines, but even dangerous facts are valuable if you've been trained to deal with them. This must be Levin, though. He is young. And of course, this is one of the major things, themes, excuse me, themes in Dune that Frank Herbert helps us get into the mind of the characters even more. And that's why books are infinitely better than movies because they instantly help us get into the mind of characters, of what's going on. And Herbert takes that to the nth degree because he does it in the middle of a chapter with italics and sometimes changing between multiple characters, even though that's kind of wonky and crazy. He gets away with it because he is a good writer and he gets this supposedly from Shakespeare. And I would agree with that, but he's taking it to the next level, to the 60s, LSD, science fiction level. And he does it really well. And once again, this is such an important part of the book. And another big thing that Shakespeare takes from people like Shakespeare and others who wrote in the iambic pentameter in, in poetry in that era is that a lot of the a lot of his work according to him quote much of the prose and dune started out as haiku and then it was given minimal additional word padding to make it conform to the english the english sentence structure and this is so important because frank herbert started this off with basically haikus with a rhythmic metered metered verse and that's why some of this works too if you want to layer a book and make it really good what do you do you bring in archetypes you bring in sound and verse and meter these are all things and then if you disguise it within the text and don't let people see it it subliminally makes it good why is this book still so popular 60 years later because of these things this is what artists and writers don't understand and how do you learn uh, do you know how to write an iambic pentameter? Do you know how to write met metered verse? Or uh, maybe have you read the book, The Seven Mystery of the Seven Vows, and understand how to use vowels in language? I'm still a beginner in all this stuff. It requires a high level of skill, and that's why, once again, success leaves clues. Frank's Herbert, Frank Herbert's success is obvious. The books are all very good. And yeah, this is just something I find really interesting. He's getting this from the East, and that's something that we... We'll be talking about maybe in a bit, but let's just get to it now. The influence of the East on Frank Herbert. And of course, if we look, a lot of the things that people are doing, like the Ben Jesuits, they achieve that Zen-like focus that people in the West obviously never really achieved. The East, especially yogis, have the highest rate of enlightenment, at least in the at least in at least in history. And why do they do that? How did they get there? Because they focus on the control of the body, mind, and spirit at very high levels that's all they would do there was no pageantry and or no knights errant they would focus on these things and that's at some level what the ben jesuit are doing and a lot of the inspiration for them comes from that and a lot of the certain things that they say to each other a lot of the a lot of the characters that sometimes speak in koans or and there's riddles and rhymes all throughout this text and that really isn't as present in western society as it is in eastern society frank herbert like Buddhism, he studied Buddhism, and all throughout the text, you kind of see that philosophical, natural underpinning, connection to nature, it are pinnacles in Eastern thought. So another perspective I've not heard anyone talk about is Dune's connection to the Iliad. I've seen some people talk about the connection to Achilles. I don't feel like that's very strong, but there is a connection to the breakdown of customs in Dune and in the Iliad. Because if we look at the Iliad, when the strongest points of view to look at it through is the breakdown of customs in the honor culture for instance the breakdown of the institution of marriage at the start then as we get there there um with the with the fight between paris and one of the kings it's not like the a lot of people have never even read the iliad they just saw the movie with brad pitt and they're like or troy or whatever and they're like oh my god but in the in in the book there's actually a stray arrow someone shoots an arrow supposedly and maybe a god made it happen and it hits the king 
and Paris gets lifted off the battlefield. So then the on uh, the 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 custom of truces is now gone. Agamemnon takes one of Achilles concubines away and that takes away um that that breaks down the custom that the king gives out his gives out spoils of war and is fair about it. Then, you know, eventually at the end the Greeks are doing human sacrifices and it all gets restored when King I can't remember the king's name right now, Priam comes and meets with Achilles and asks for Hector's body back. And if you, a lot of people don't know this, the Iliad doesn't end with the Trojan horse uh, scene. It ends right there, which kind of gives you a clue about what it's the climax and ending of the book is the restoration of justice and order in the kingdom, uh, or at least of the custom, of some of the customs, because they have 12 days of, you know, uh, 12 days of funeral rites. So that's just a really interesting connection I've never heard anyone talk about, because in Dune, what do we start to see? We start to see the use of explosives and trickery by the emperor against the Atreides. And then we see the same thing starting to happen with the Atreides against the Harkonnen, and then against the Spacing Guild, then against the Ben Jezra. All these orders and all these customs, and eventually all customs and all everything is totally destroyed by Leto II. All forms of power and dict they're all destroyed. And you could and a new order is established. It is the order of Leto. And at some level you could view it that breakdown as similar to what happened because that's the first story in history and that's interesting that has such, that's such a big theme because that happens all of the time that's what for instance when we go into afghanistan for instance and we obviously we failed in an unjustified war to begin with because we couldn't replace the honor culture with our own system we didn't have the time and that's for instance what the taliban do they are the intermediaries but now let's hop over to sophocles or to sophocles's play oedipus rex so of course oedipus rex and as we see right here this is one of the connections to dune the blind prophet the blind king the blind the blind king paul at the end of book number two or three can't remember tripping out right now be becomes blind i think two and then gets sent out yeah number two i'm sorry of course he comes back as the preacher number three comes gets exiled out into the desert as the blind prophet as this blind person and the other big connection that we see of course is the introduction of prescience prescience is such a big dune a big deal in dune because the quiz exact hatterick if i'm saying that correctly literally means jump the path and that's what prescience does it helps you jump the path and and see into the future or see certain outcomes of events and of course that gets totally crazy and muddled especially in four five and six it goes absolutely crazy with the ideas of prescience but that's also if we look at oedipus oedipus rex or Oedip yeah that of course there's that idea the oracle giving these um ideas out and this plays once again where does this idea come from where are the axiomatic origins and we have to track those if we are going to understand some of frank herbert's influences and why would he include the blind, pro blind prophet you may say oh people being able to tell the future that's like a big deal but why is there this connection to that and at some level incest is another big deal in the series so in books number two and three, we start to see the idea of incest happening. Aaliyah is naked for Paul and at some level is trying to seduce him because she has gone to the evil. As she is starting to move toward evil. Leto II is in love at some level with his sister, but chooses the path of light. In book number four, we, rely, we realize that the Atreides have been known to mate together throughout history because there aren't that many people around for them. And it's kind of a wonky thing. We see the same thing in... Oedipus Rex. I don't, you know, I'm not going to surmise that to this much. This It doesn't go to the HBO Game of Thrones level, but still really good. So next we have The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. And of course, I say that wrong almost every single week on this channel, but who cares? So this has been talked about on the forums. I've seen people always mentioning the connection to the Dune series. If you know more than what I'm about to say, let me know. The only really thing that I see a connection to is of course some of the big moral questions and ultimately the religion that you are helping build kill you as Paul is killed or the preacher is killed by one of his own priests. I don't really see that connection but apparently Frank Dune was influenced by this book and of course really everybody's influenced by this book including me when I, I'm writing on one of the novels I'm working on right now. There is a slight influence of this book in there and no one would ever really know unless you really were reaching or really trying to analyze it but a lot of these ideas, a lot of these great stories continue on even when we don't realize it. So we have Alfred Corbuxy, Corbuxy 
and his book, Science and Sanity, an introduction to non-Aristotelian systems and general semantics. And this, I'll show you guys this book really fast. Before we get into a quote from this book, this book is kind of wild. And I remember reading this book after I read, I think, Cosmic Trigger or Quantum, Cosmic Trigger, Quantum Psychology, Prometheus Rising, one of those by Robert Anton Wilson. And a lot of people, of course, in our society today are stuck in the logical Aristotelian systems because to function in an objective reality, those are what you need most. But once you started maybe experimenting with psychedelic drugs, meditation, spending a lot of time out in nature, not caring about what the world thinks or about money, you start to realize there are cracks in the simulation that maybe life doesn't, maybe works in non-linear ways sometimes, chaos theory. And Alfred Corbett is really the father of this. And when I read this book when I was 19, it blew my mind. And it actually sent me down a path of being a little bit too illogical, a little bit too right-brained. But Frank Herbert, throughout the series, is playing with language and the idea, idea of language and how language controls us. And apparently he took some seminars on this text and was really into it. And let's read a quote from one of the Dune books. Quote, In all major socializing, socializing forces, you will find an underlying movement to gain and maintain power through the use of words. From, the witch, from witch doctor to priest to bureaucrat, it is all the same. A governed populace must be conditioned to accept power words as actual things to confuse the symbolized system with the tangible universe. In the maintenance of such a power structure, certain symbols are kept out of the reach of common understanding. Symbols such as those dealing with economic manipulation or those with, which define the local interpretation of sanity. Symbol secrecy of this form leads to the development of fragmented sublanguages. Each, each being a signal that is that its users are accumulating some form of power. With this insight into a power process, our imperial, imperial security force must be ever alert to the formation of sub-languages. And, of course, this is so important. And we see the sanity, inter, local inter, interpretation of sanity. Boom, it's right there. And this is such a big deal. When you are looking at the Ben Jezra and what they're trying to do, they are controlling with language. And Paul first gets to do, and they're already seeding this... Seeing this uh, sowing the seeds of the of the Messiah, of the Mahdi coming. And this is what happens in our society all the time. People don't realize how much words affect us. And my favorite thing to say on this channel is the greatest conspiracy of all isn't the conspiracy that, that everyone loves to talk about. And maybe some of them are true. Some of them are. It's the conspiracy that every single time when I leave my house, I drove across Las Vegas today. I was all around Las Vegas today. Not one time did I see one positive message. All I saw was lack. Lack, you need this. You need that. You don't have that. You don't have the Tesla. Advertisements telling me what I need to do. People zooming by me, trying to get somewhere fast. I never saw a positive message saying, hey, this is an abundant world and you, you were loved and you should trust it and blah, blah, blah. Why don't we have that everywhere? I would really think that if, because we know how subliminal words and linguistics influence people, the greatest conspiracy, I think, and the greatest proof that we're not really in a very loving or very supportive society is that there are not affirmations all around us telling us that we can do good. I don't know what that would do, but I think that would do a lot. Maybe not though, because we live in such a brain dead world that so they might people not even not even understand, but they do. Anyway, so this is a very very influential book, and this kind of gets into Saussure and Derrida and the the jump over the transcendental the, the abyss of the transcendental signifier. And understanding all this is a very big rabbit hole, and I would recommend everyone start to explore. Alfred's work and if you there's some good summaries online I'm going to be doing a book review or book breakdown and by the time you see this it will already be out so this is a hard book to read I'm not going to tell you that it isn't but it's a it's one of the most valuable books on this list to read and to understand so another influence is Isaac Am 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 Amiovs I'm sorry I'm butchering his name right now I should he's Asimov excuse me Asimov's foundation series and what this the influence on dune with this series is that the epigrams at the start of each chapter where did dune get where did frank herbert get that idea where did the, the, these ideas come from for each chapter and some some chapters in dune are only three or four pages and there's always one and it kind of gives you a looming foreshadowing of what's going to happen if not the whole plot if not just spoiling everything in those epigrams and that comes from isaac asimov's foundation series which i thought was a really cool connection because i've read that but i didn't know that that's where this really started at least in the sci-fi world so another interesting connection is to uh, Lawrence Lawrence of Arabia and T.E. Lawrence and Lawrence of Arabia. And we're just going to read this whole passage from Moongadget.com, this article by Justine Shaw, because I think it's, I'm just going to let her speak for this. It's kind of a sensitive, weird topic. So let's, let's, let's hop into it. During World War I, Thomas Lawrence got himself assigned to a kind of liaison, li li liaison between 
Arabian Budins and the British Army. He surprised the Budins and his superiors by becoming a military leader, organized a string of spectacular victories against the German-backed, well-armed Turks. He became a dark messiah to the Budins and, mixed blessing, and a mixed blessing to the British. In 1926, Lawrence recorded his adventures in the autobiographical novel, the Seven Pillars of Wisdom, which was immediately lauded as the greatest adventure story of all ever told. It had all the elements of swashbuckling yarn, and it was all true. In 1962, Lawrence's story was retold, okay? Paul is a messianic man of two tribes, leading the Jihad of Budians are the Fremen, the Harkonnens are the Turks, the Sardaukur are the German troops, and the Padishah Emperor Shaddam V, or whatever that is, IV, represents both the German government and the British crown. In his autobiography, Lawrence explains how his homosexuality contributed to his military career. He says that he was initially attracted to soldiering because of the all-male environment, and his desire to impress other men sexually is what ultimately motivated him to become a hero. Rather than writing a gay male hero, Herbert transformed Lawrence's homosexuality to Dune, Dune's villain, the Baron Harkonnen. According to Herbert's bi biography, he considered male homosexuality immoral and died without ever expressing love or approval for his gay son, Bruce. In a world where gay teens are four times more likely to commit suicide, it's a shame that the stories of real-life gay heroes are more often retold so dishonestly. As Herbert knew better than anyone, Paul Atreides was largely based off on, on a real human being. And his great love wasn't a woman named Chani, but a man named Dahum. Paul may have been also molded partially on Alexander the Great, who may, many historians call the greatest military genius of all time. Alexander was also gay, and his boy's friend was a strikingly handsome soldier named Hephaestion. Hephaestion. And that's kind of a dark history that Frank Herbert ostracized and um, kicked out of his life, his own son, forget, estranged his own son for being gay, for being, you know, homosexual. And obviously that's not good. Obviously that's absolutely terrible. And we're going to be getting into Frank Herbert's life, uh, personal life in a, a, just a hot second. But this whole Lawrence of Arabia idea and reversing a lot of these things in books, one of the best ways to steal like an artist is not to steal completely, but is to actually just make the reverse, to see a character and just reverse it, to see the how someone acts and just reverse their behavior, maybe in your life, maybe in a text, and you could take all that same power, the whole character, and just turn them into the opposite. It's like an archetypal shadow figure or a shadow figure turning into a figure of light. It's a really dynamic technique that Herbert uses in multiple figures throughout the text. All right, so to conclude, we're going to talk about Herbert's personal life, and he does not have a great personal history. You know, I hope, you know, I really try to keep it together, everybody. If you're that author trying to make it, please don't be violent. Don't be controlling. Don't be manipulative. Obviously, don't sexually assault people. Like, please, can we get it together, everybody? Like, oh, my God. Like, it just never ends. These stories of these terrible people, and maybe that's what it takes. That's why I've always heard that. That's what it takes to become a great author. I think that's just lies, that you have to be so narcissistic and self-centered and try so hard that this is what it takes. So, and it, it's such a cutthroat industry. So let's go over some of the, this is from the website, once again, moon, moongadget.com. Paul's mother and most of the women in the story are Ben Jesuit. Herbert's mother and 10 aunts were Jesuit. Fremen displayed religious awe as they, okay, that one's not very good. Paul would catch a ride from a giant sandworms as they passed by. Herbert would catch a ride from tugboats pulling large barges, okay. Mentats are human computers. Herbert's grandmother, although she lacked formal education, has an uncanny knack with numbers. I'm just reading the best ones, everybody. Paul's parents were concerned with the safety, almost to the point of distraction from their superheroically important jobs. Herbert's parents were depressive alcoholics who barely registered his existence. Reversal. Paul receives the best education imaginable, akin to Alexander. Herbert was unable to attend university. Another reversal. Ben Jesuits are true sayers, possessing the magic ability to tell if people are lying or not. They use the pain box to torture Paul for what they believe are ultimately altruistic reasons. Herbert's highway patrolman father often threatened to, to subject young Frank to a lie detector. As an adult, Frank made good on his father's threat, actually purchasing a lie detector and often forcing his sons Brian and Bruce to submit to it. Brian compares the lie detector to the pain box from his father's book, an instrument of control through torture. He later learned that his father had rigged the box to give him whatever answer he wanted. And obviously that is not good. And that's very manipulative but it takes a person like frank herbert who is manipulative and crazy to have that range and hue of emotions and ideas and weirdness to write such a complex and wide-ranging book as dune as the dune series so what did i miss everybody subscribe to the channel and make sure to tune in to more videos on dune which are going to be displayed right here right here no 
right here when they come out soon. Peace, everybody.